All right, welcome back. My name is Jordan Barnes. I'm a grateful addict in recovery. My drug of choice is IV heroin, cocaine, followed closely by alcohol. My home group is Sand Island Treatment Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. And my clean date is August 29th, 2011. I am also an author. And on August 29th, 2020, I released my debut memoir, One Hit Away, A Memoir of Recovery. I'm so humbled this book went on to win a 2020's Best Book of the Year Award by Indies Today, which is amazing and just super humbling. And I couldn't be happier with that. It just, it, it tells me I'm on the right track and I just love I love, I love this new direction that I'm heading in. Okay, so the thing is, I know that I am often wrong. I've been proven wrong enough times and I don't have an ego that prevents me from admitting when I've made a mistake or when I need to change my way of thinking. And part of a big portion of my program of recovery is to imua, which is to always move forward, to keep growing, to be open and receptive to new ideas. So anytime there's someone that says that they can teach me something new or they can show me why a way of thinking might not be the best way, I'm open. I'm all ears. And I don't necessarily always agree with them, but I'm open. And I think that's really important. So I'm excited for this because that's what today's video appears to be all about. It's another TED Talk. And this one is called Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. Let's get into it. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. Right off the bat, I've experienced trying to wake up somebody who's OD'd. I've woken up next to a dead body and that is life changing. And I hope he's not young. I hope he's not going back to his childhood because that can be as traumatic as it was for a, a young man. I can only imagine how, how difficult that would be for a child. And I was just a little kid, so I didn't really understand why. But as I got older, I realized we had drug addiction in my family, including later cocaine addiction. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately, partly because it's now exactly 100 years since drugs were first banned in the United States and Britain, and we then imposed that on the rest of the world. It's a century since we made this really fateful decision. And how's that working out? Haven? The character and friend from my book is actually in Portland, and she was a chief petitioner for Measure 110, which doesn't have to be as controversial as it was. It's basically decriminalizing, not legalizing, decriminalizing small portions of drugs. But people get caught up on that. There's a whole other aspect to that, and that is getting people the resources and help that they need and not forcing it on people that don't want. It's very, it's a long thing. Uh, I know enough about it to comment somewhat intelligently, but I have a video on that. I'll link it below. Amazing conversation. It went on for two and a half hours. If you have the time, I highly suggest it. And I'm not being biased. To take addicts and punish them and make them suffer because we believe that would deter them. It would give them an incentive to stop. No. And by the way, there's just as many drugs in most jails or prisons than out. And in some cases, it's even easier and more accessible. So this whole idea of locking someone away and they're going to be safe and, and that's going to cure their addiction and stop them from causing self-harm. I don't know where that comes from. It comes from the media and just fear. And a few years ago, I was looking at some of the addicts in my life who I love and trying to figure out if there was some way to help them. And I realized there were loads of incredibly basic questions I just didn't know the answer to. Like, what really causes addiction? Uh, why do we carry on with this approach that doesn't seem to be working? And is there a better way out there that we could try instead? So I read loads of stuff about it, and I couldn't really find the answers I was looking for. So I thought, OK, I'll go and sit with different people around the world who've lived this and studied this and talk to them. I really like people that have a question and they put in the effort to go and find an answer. They don't just take the easy answer. They don't just Google it. They say, hey, let's look at something that a lot of people have been wondering for a long time and I'm going to investigate it and I'm going to learn for myself talking to people 
what I can. I'm going to see what I see and hear what I hear. And so right on for this guy for making that effort. And it's obviously a deeply personal thing because it's like, like me, he also has a family that struggles with addiction. And my hat's off to him. I, I respect that tremendously. And see if I can learn from them. And I ended up, I didn't realize I would end up going over 30,000 miles at the start, but I ended up going and meeting loads of different people from a transgender crack dealer in Brownsville. What's on his hand? <laughs> That's awesome. Brooklyn to a scientist who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see if they like them. Um, By the way, we have lots of mongooses or mongoose out mongooses, sly mongooses out here in Hawaii. And um, they're everywhere. They look like little rats, long little rats. I'm not sure where they're from or where they're going. <laughs> It turns out they do, but only in very specific circumstances. To, to the only country that's ever decriminalized all drugs, from cannabis to crack, Portugal. Portugal. Measure 110 is modeled off of Portugal. And the crazy thing is people look at Portland without doing the research and they just like jump to conclusions like uh, that movie on with that mat. They, they don't do the basic, basic, basic research. Portugal did this. Portugal is effectively what Oregon is duplicating with small modifications. But what happened in Portugal worked and what's going to happen in Portland will also work. I know they're under a lot of stress and pressure because all eyes are on them, but they have nothing to fear. Obviously, what they were doing hasn't been working forever, like this guy talked about. So it's time for something to change. And the thing I realized that really blew my mind is almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. And if we start to absorb the new evidence about addiction, I think we're going to have to change a lot more than our drug policies. But let's start with what we think we know, what I thought I know, right? Let's think about this middle row here, right? Imagine all of you, for 20 days now, went off and used heroin three times a day. Some of you look a little bit more enthusiastic than others at this prospect. Um, the, don't worry, it's just a thought experiment. Imagine I wonder if someone in the crowd's like, yep, <laughs> been there, <laughs> done that. You did that, right? What, do we, what would happen? Now, we have a story about what would happen that we've been told for a century. We think, because there are chemical hooks in heroin, as you took it for a while, your body would become dependent on those hooks, you'd start to physically need them, and at the end of those 20 days, you'd all be heroin addicts, right? That's what I thought. I like that terminology, hooks. I, once, I described it in my book as like, like, it latched on its talons and burrowed its hooks into me. That's really what it feels like. You hear a monkey on your back, but it really, it's like something you can't shake off. There's no way to get comfortable. This thing is like, impeding your movement, right? It's destructive and it's uncomfortable. That's exactly what it's like. It's like digging its hooks into you and it doesn't let you go. First thing that alerted me to the fact something not right with this story, is when it was explained to me, if I step out of this TED talk today and I get hit by a car and I break my hip, I'll be taken to hospital and I'll be given loads of diamorphine. Yeah. Diamorphine is heroin. It's actually much better heroin than you're ever going to buy on the streets because the stuff you buy from a drug dealer is contaminated. Actually, very little of it is heroin. And now it has fentanyl, so you're totally screwed. I'm so grateful I got clean when I did because I hear about people using and I hear about the overdose rates, especially with COVID. It's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Mothers that are messaging me and they say my kid is using it's just it's scary because you don't know what they're getting and it's in everything it's in molly it's in pills it's in press xanax i mean fentanyl is scary it's terrifying and a lot of that there's a lot of a lot of factors but a lot of drug supplies have been interrupted with the shutdown that's been going on for well over a year now and all of that sort of leads into this just scary environment that a lot of people are suffering through whereas the stuff you get from the doctor is medically pure. And you'll be given it for quite a long period of time. There are loads of people in this room who may not realize that you've taken quite a lot of heroin, right? Uh, and, for, and anyone watching this anywhere in the world, this is happening. And if what we believe about addiction is right, those people are exposed to all those chemical hooks. What should happen? They should become addicts. This has been studied really carefully. It doesn't happen. You will have noticed if your grandmother had a hip replacement, she didn't come out as a junkie. <laughs> I don't have personal experience from any sort of injury. I've thankfully never broken a bone. I've never, I've never been actually in a hospital where I've been on a Dilaudid drip or anything like that. But I can 
only imagine that there are some people out there that are like, no, I got hooked super quick. So I don't know if this is an assumption. I'm not going to I'm not going to say from experience, but it sounds to me like this can go either way. And I think a lot of it is your mindset going into it. You know, if you go into a hospital and you get diagnosed something or if you get prescribed something, when you're done, you're done. And people can leave and say, oh, I'm no, no longer prescribed anything. And there's some people that can do that. And there's some people that can't. And my heart goes out to those people because it's not that they're set up, but they didn't ask for this. And then they just feel physically dependent. They don't like how that feels, or maybe they loved how it feels. And then next thing you know, they're addicts of some nature. When I learned this, it just seemed so weird to me. So contrary to everything I'd been told, everything I thought I knew, I just thought it couldn't be right. Until I went and met a man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor of psychology in Vancouver, who carried out an incredible experiment that I think really helps us to understand this issue. Professor Alexander explained to me, the idea of addiction we've all got in our heads, that story, comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. You can do them tonight when you go home if you feel a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. Where do you get a rat? And if you go to the store to buy a rat to do a science experiment, something's wrong with you, so you're already going into this with horrible, in <laughs> horrible intentions. I feel bad putting poison out for rats that go into my chicken coop. In fact, I, I, I don't do it because I'm afraid that they're going to drag the poison inside. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. But don't rats like drugs? Doesn't every experiment prove that rats like drugs? <laughs> so there you go, right? That's how we think it works. In the 70s, Professor Alexander comes along and he looks at this experiment and he noticed something. He said, ah, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. Let's try something a bit different. So Professor Alexander built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically <laughs> heaven for rats, right? <laughs> they've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they've got loads of tunnels. Crucially, they've got loads of friends, they can have loads of sex, and they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. You go from almost 100... That's really interesting. I guess there's a really good metaphor to life. If you feel like you're all alone and you feel like you don't have anything to occupy your mind or maybe you don't want to experience emotions and you want to be just in a white padded room by yourself and i wonder if people are predisposed to that i wonder if there's people you know that don't like other people that don't want to be around other people don't like conversing with them they don't they don't want to be active they don't want to do things they don't want to be fascinated or entertained and perhaps it can go both ways. Well outside of my, uh, my way, way above my pay grade. 100% overdose when they're isolated to 0% overdose when they have happy and connected lives. Now, that's insane. Whoa. From 100% to nil. I'll say nil because this guy's from London, uh, or I assume he's from London because this TEDx is happening in London. Or Lon Dunn. When he first saw this, Professor Alexander thought, you know, maybe this is just a thing about rats. They're quite different to us. You know, not, maybe not as different as we'd like, but, you know. Um, but fortunately, there was a human experiment into the exact same principle happening at the exact same time. It was called the Vietnam War. I was going to say, is there an ethical uh, setup? <laughs> I don't think you can ethically do certain experiments. It's like that one where you have a train track and the operator has to make a choice between killing the train's supposed to go one way and if it goes that way it'll kill one person but if it deviates and goes the way it's not supposed to go it'll kill five something like that and and they 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 up until recently they haven't been able to actually study this because they were concerned over the trauma it would induce on the people partaking in the study because it forces them to decide who are you going to kill are you going to kill the person that's not supposed to be there? Or are you going to say, well, I'm going to kill the person that is supposed to be there doing his work, 
I'm going to kill him because I'm not going to kill these five people. And it's that like moral dilemma. Well, the five people aren't supposed to be there. And this guy is doing his work. And, you know, I totally set that up um, incorrectly. But you get my point. The point is that it was going to be dangerous to study. They didn't want to subject someone to that because they were afraid of the ramifications that person would internalize and take with them from that point on. Like, oh, my gosh, I killed five people. I'm a horrible person. I can't believe I did that. In Vietnam, 20% of all American troops were using loads of heroin. And uh, if you look at the news reports from the time, they were really worried because they thought, my God, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war ends. It made total sense. Now, those soldiers who were using loads of heroin were followed home. The archives of general psychiatry did a really detailed study. And what happened to them? It turns out they didn't go to rehab. They didn't go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped. Now, if you believe the story about chemical hooks, that makes absolutely no sense. I don't know the full story, but my mom's brother died after coming back from Vietnam. And I've heard different things. I've heard that he was on heroin. I've heard he wasn't. I've heard that he was found um, behind his couch in his full camis, his BDUs, and he was having flashbacks, what we now know as PTSD or what was called shell shock. But it's always been ambiguous. Did he die from an overdose? And no one's ever really told me the truth because, I don't know, it's maybe hard for them to accept. I think that it's sad no matter how you look at it. I know that he I know that he was having drugs sent to him. I've been told it was just pot. I'm sure it was dope if, if that's what he was strung out on. I, I can only imagine he would have it sent home. It's just sad. It's just so sad. The whole idea of not of not even understanding that people have this PTSD disorder and not being able to get help for it and self-medicating to the point where they take their own lives or commit suicide or overdose or all of the above. Sense. But Professor Alexander began to think there might be a different story about addiction. He said, what if addiction isn't about your chemical hooks? What if addiction is about your cage? What if addiction is an adaptation to your environment? Looking at this, there was another professor called Peter Cohen in the Netherlands who said, maybe we shouldn't even call it addiction. Maybe we should call it bonding. Human beings have a natural and innate need to bond. And when we're happy and healthy, we'll bond and connect with each other. But if you can't do that because you're traumatized or isolated or beaten down by life, you will bond with something that will give you some sense of relief. I'm really fortunate. I was strung out in Portland, but I came home to Hawaii. I went to treatment. I went to rehab. And then I've been clean and sober since. But I did a geographical change and I left all of that city behind. And I don't know. I'm not going to blame the city. It's not the city's fault. Right. I chose to do what I chose to do because I, that's what I did. But by removing myself from that environment or that rat park, wait, they weren't using drugs in rat park. By removing myself from that environment and coming back here and having a support group with like water sports and activities. And it's just a totally, it's been, it's been an easy go. I'm, I'm so blessed, but I do believe that I've been set up for success because I'm in a position where I can live the life. I can make the life that I want to live for myself. Now, that might be gambling, that might be pornography, that might be cocaine, that might be cannabis, but you will bond and connect with something because that's our nature. That's what we want as human beings. And I think, you know, at first I found this quite a difficult thing to get my head around, but one way that helped me to think about it is, and I can see, you know, I've got over by my seat there a bottle of water, right? I'm looking at lots of you, and lots of you have bottles of water with you, right? Forget drugs, forget the drug war, totally legally, all of those... I've put heroin in everyone's water. <laughs> Those bottles of water <laughs> could be bottles of vodka, right? We could all be getting drunk, I might, after this. Um, and, but we're not, right? Now, because you've been able to afford the approximately a gazillion pounds that it costs to get into a TED Talk, I'm guessing you guys could afford to be drinking vodka for the next six months. You wouldn't end up homeless. You're not going to do that. And the reason you're not going to do that is not because anyone's stopping you. It's because you've got bonds and connections that you want to be present for. You've got work you love, you've got people you love, you've got healthy relationships. And a core part of addiction, I came to think, and I believe the evidence suggests, is about not being able to bear to be present in your life. Yeah, 
I understand that for most people. I think that for most people, that's enough for them not to throw everything away. But I would also say that it's not like that across the board. There's going to be people in there that when they start drinking, they can't stop. Or maybe they start, they stop, and they can't stop thinking about it, which is just as uh, miserable, if not probably worse, because you, they're just lusting and longing for this, and they can't wait to get back to it. And it just eats away at them, which is also a whole nother painful existence to go through. So I get it. I get what he's saying. Um, but there's people that will throw away everything, including their, their children, their kids, to, to use and drink. Those bonds are, aren't strong enough to override that. <laughs> now, this has really significant implications. The most obvious implications are for the war on drugs, right? In Arizona, I went out with a group of women who were made to wear T-shirts saying I was a drug addict and go out on chain gangs and dig graves while members of the public could jeer at them. And when those women get out of prison, they're going to have criminal records that mean they'll never work in the legal economy. I know Arizona's have done some pretty nuts shit. Isn't that considered cruel and unusual? I mean, isn't humiliating akin to putting somebody in the kind with the, like, the scarlet leather on them? Or, you know, isn't that, isn't that cruel and, and unusual? It's not something that every state does. It's not something most states have even done in the past. Or is it? I could be wrong. I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm talking about half the time. I started this off with saying I'm wrong all the time. Me again. Now, that's a very extreme example, obviously, in the case of the chain gang. But actually, almost everywhere in the world, we treat addicts to some degree like that. We punish them, we shame them, we give them criminal records, we put True. barriers between them reconnecting. And there was a doctor in Canada, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, an amazing man, who said to me, if you wanted to design a system that would make addiction worse, you would design that system. Now, there's a place that... So true. So true. I am so blessed and fortunate that I do not have felonies on my record. records. I can vote. I can go out and get jobs. I can get housing if I didn't own my home. There's all sorts of things that I can do by not being a criminal. And the thing is, I haven't used in 10 years. But if I had a felony from that long ago, it would be with me to this day. Now, you can have your own opinion on on you can have your own opinion on on how how long a punishment should last. Is it a life sentence? Do we want to give people a life sentence that prevents them from going on to basically be the best that they can, or do we want to just throw? balls and chains around their ankles and say, there you go, you, you've, had, you've struggled with addiction at some point in your life, you're always going to be lesser than and judge them and, and, and hold them back. What kind of people do we want to be? I decided to do the exact opposite and I went there to see how it worked. In the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is kind of mind-blowing. And every year, they tried uh. the American way more and more. They punished people and stigmatized them and shamed them more. And every year, the problem got worse. And one day, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and basically said, look, we can't go on with a country where we're having ever more people becoming heroin addicts. Let's set up a panel of scientists and doctors to figure out what would genuinely solve the problem. And they set up a panel led by an amazing man called Dr. Huao Gulao to look at all this. Real quick, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. It's new evidence. And they came back. And they said, decriminalize all drugs, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we used to spend on cutting addicts off, on disconnecting them, and spend it instead on reconnecting them with the society. And that's not, it's interesting, that's not really what we think of. What they did wasn't really what we think of as drug treatment in the United States and Britain. So they do do residential rehab, yeah. they do do psychological therapy that does have some value. But the biggest thing they did was the complete opposite of what we do. A massive program of job creation for addicts and micro-loans for addicts to set up small businesses. So say you used to be a mechanic. When you're ready, they go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half. That's cool. I don't know if Measure 110 has microloans. I'm not sure to the extent what they do, but I know that there's a bunch of things in there to basically improve support and also to get funding for certain things. Like I think Haven is, has been trying for years to get a drug spectrometer where people can bring their drugs to a needle exchange and she can scan it and be like, this has, this will kill you. If you inject this, this will kill you. Or this will kill your friend if you give it to them. And people just 
they can't get past it. They're like, why are we giving all these services to addicts? And it's 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 bigger than that, right? People can go on and live happy, happy, healthy lives. All of us know somebody that's afflicted with addiction in some way, but it's not a life sentence. They don't have to go on and be an addict for the rest of their life if they don't want to. And that's the key, if they don't want to. We all know coerced treatment is not more effective than voluntary, volunteered treatment. So forcing someone to go to, to to inpatient treatment doesn't yield higher results than if someone opts to go. So it's not necessarily one way or the other. Half his wages. The goal was to make sure that every addict in Portugal had something to get out of bed for in the morning. And when I went and oh. met the addicts in Portugal, it's fascinating. What they said is, as they rediscovered purpose, they rediscovered bonds and relationships with the wider society. It'll be uh, 15 years this year since that experiment began and the results are in. Injecting drug use is down in Portugal, according to the British Journal of Criminology, by 50 percent, 5 0 percent. Overdose is massively down, HIV is massively down among addicts, uh, addiction in every study is significantly down. One of the ways you know it's worked so well is that almost nobody in Portugal wants to go. You like apples? How do you like them apples? I mean, come on, you can't argue against numbers, right? You can't fight statistics. Portugal what they pulled off so long ago is working in spades, whereas a city like Portland just had overdose rates, I think up 300% in 2020. Last year was the worst year of addiction and overdose ever, ever. I mean, last year was the worst year for addiction and overdose deaths ever on record. So many people went back to using, so many people relapsed, so many people died and there's got to be a better way. And the good news is, the hope is, they found it. Back to the old system. Now, that's the kind of political implications. I actually think there's a layer of implications to all this research below that. You know, we live in a culture where people feel really increasingly vulnerable to all sorts of addictions, whether it's to their smartphones or to shopping or to eating. You know, before these talks began, you guys know this, that uh, we were told we weren't allowed to have our smartphones on. And I have to say, a lot of you looked an awful lot like addicts who were being told their dealer was going to be unavailable for the next couple of hours. And yeah, a lot of... True, man. I actually, I'll be honest, I feel like, at, I feel like I'm addicted to my phone. I'm on my phone all the time. There's always some excuse. I'm checking my email. I'm, I'm checking my sales numbers. I'm playing chess. There's always something, but it's, it's actually a fear I have for my child because I, I don't, I don't want him to grow up glued to an iPad or glued to a TV. I want, I don't want that for him. So both my wife and I are, are on the same page, and we're going to be very mindful about that. But it's definitely something that if you have an addictive personality, you're, you're susceptible to it. And even if you don't, you're also susceptible to it. A lot of factors are working against you. A lot of smart people are getting you to stay on their apps for longer and longer. Of us feel like that, and it might sound weird to say, "Oh, you know, I've been talking about how disconnection is a major driver of addiction." But weird to say it's growing because you think, "Well, we're the most connected society there's ever been, surely." But I increasingly began to think that the connection we have, the connections we have, we think we have, are like a kind of parody of human connection. If you have a crisis in your life, you'll notice something. It won't be your Twitter followers who come to sit with you. It won't be your Facebook facts. <laughs> book friends who help you turn it round. It'll be your flesh and blood friends who you have deep and nuanced and textured face-to-face -face relationships with. And I think there's a, there's a study I learned about from Bill McKibben, the environmental writer, I think tells us a lot about this. There's a, it looked at the number of close friends the average American believes they can call on in a crisis. That number has been declining steadily since the 1950s. The amount of floor space an individual has in their home has been steadily increasing. And I think that's like a metaphor for the choice we've made as I think if times got really tough, I could call any counselor or staff member from Sand Island without a doubt. I, I know their number off the top of my head. Whoever picks up, I can talk to if I had to, if I needed to talk to someone. I've got a vast support group, but I'm fortunate. I have to have a large support group. I, I can't afford not to. I've got great close friends. I got my wife. I got family. But I'm an addict in recovery who depends on a large support group to survive. So I have to keep that going and I have to maintain it. It doesn't just maintain itself. I don't not talk to people forever. But there are people that I can reach out to after many, after a long time, months even. And it's just like talking to them yesterday. And that's and that's understood. You know, that's how life goes. But I, I, I work to keep that going. It's 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 intentional and it's necessary.
It's a culture, right? We've traded floor space for friends. We've traded stuff for connections, and the result is that we are one of the loneliest societies there has ever been. And yet, Bruce Alexander, the guy who did the Rat Park experiment, says we talk all the time in addiction about individual recovery, and it's right to talk about that. But we need to talk much more about social recovery. Something's gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And we created a society where, for a lot of us, life looks a whole lot more like that isolated cage, and a whole lot less like Rat Park. I also think, as a whole, we are less empathetic. It's easier to walk past somebody struggling. I just did it today on, on the way to 7-Eleven for coffee. Someone was asking for cash, and I just, I don't give out money. I, I just, I don't. That's one of my boundaries. But I'm susceptible to that too, and I'm a grateful addict in recovery that has that empathy that to begin with. I know what it's like, but I also. I have to keep clear boundaries, and, and I just I don't want to support anyone's addiction, um, and I don't trust that people will use that money for anything other than drugs. Because from my experience, at least for where I was at, that's exactly where it went to. I would steal food, buy the dope. If I'm honest, this isn't why I went into it, right? I didn't go in to discover the political stuff, the social stuff. I wanted to know how to help the people I love, and when I came back from this long journey and I'd learned all this. I looked at the addicts in my life, and if, you know, if you're really candid, it's it's hard loving an addict, and there's going to be lots of people who know in this room,、yeah. you're angry a lot of the time, and addicts will push you away because you're the biggest threat to their addiction. Across the board, I got a whole video on that. We can be the toughest to those that love because those that we love want the best for us. Um, I think one of the reasons why this debate is so charged is because it runs through the heart of each of us, right? Everyone has a bit of them that looks at an addict and thinks, "I wish someone would just stop you." And the kind of script we're told for how to deal with the addicts in our lives is typified by, I think, by the reality show Intervention. If you guys haven't seen it, I think everything in our lives is typified by reality TV. But that's another, that's another TED talk.、Um, Side note: I sold dope to a guy that was on that show Intervention, and he says he knew it the whole time. He's like, they didn't hide it very well. Obviously, if anyone's following an addict around with cameras, it's High chances to show intervention, but he really wanted the recovery, so he played along. And、uh, I sold him dope after he was on the show, so he definitely didn't stay clean that time.、Uh, if you've never seen the show Intervention, it's pretty simple premise: you get an addict, all the people in their life, gather them together, and say, "If you don't shape up, confront them with what they're doing, and they say, 'If you don't shape up, we're going to cut you off.'" Right? So what they do is they take the connection to the addict and they threaten it. They make it contingent on the addict behaving the way they want. Um, and I began to think. I began to see why that approach doesn't work, and I began to think that almost that's like the importing of the logic of the drug war into our private lives. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, how can I be Portuguese, right? And <laughs> what I try to do now, and I can't tell you I do it consistently, and I can't tell you it's easy, is to say to the addicts in my life that I want to deepen the connection with them. To say to them, I love you, whether you're using or you're not. I love you, whatever state you're in, and if you need me, I'll come and sit with you. But- I like this guy. I think we would be friends if we weren't worlds apart. Because I love you, and I don't want you to be alone or to feel alone. And I think the core of that message, "You're not alone. We love you," has to be at every level of how we respond to addicts, socially, politically, and individually. For a hundred years now. We've been singing war songs about addicts. I think all along we should have been singing love songs to them, because the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Thank you. Fantastic! I like the guy. I like his talk. I agree with it pretty much across the board. I love seeing talks like these. To me, that this is just something that really hits home.、Um, If you agree, please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm a new channel. I could really use your support. If you wouldn't mind taking a second to like and subscribe, it would do a lot for me. And I'm going to keep these coming. I'm really growing from them, and I love I love the self education that comes with these talks. These guys are just they're wonderful. So, okay, until next time, ahui ho. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for spending time with me. Aloha.